Yeah, we're behind in here, so we got to get going. All right. So, Chase's Rebellion. I went off with the money supply. Which which state, Rhode Island or Massachusetts, was printing money? Oh, uh, Rhode Island. Which one allowed more people to vote? Rhode Island was printing money. Which oh, one? Rhode Island. Yeah, uh, Rhode Island had greater suffrage. <laughs> and I talked about which one was more conservative economically, Rhode Island or Massachusetts? Massachusetts. Yeah, Massachusetts. Yeah, that's one thing people don't really talk when they talk about conservative and liberal. It's the economics. So, Shays' Rebellion would be the outcome of all of this. This would directly lead to the Constitution, Shays' Rebellion. And so, basically it began 1786 into 1787, and you have all these farmers who were in debt. Daniel Shays was actually a larger landholder, but he came to represent these farmers. Many of them were being put in prison because of debtors' courts, losing everything, furious at the way that veterans were being treated. You can argue that a lot of it was veterans angry at, remember I told you they sold their bonds for a penny on the dollar and things like that. And so they called themselves the regulators. Before the Revolutionary War, this happened in North Carolina and Pennsylvania too. And regulators as in the regulating or control. If I say regulation, that means strictly controlled at that time. Of the, the unfair government. And so they started here. Oh, they got me standing in the middle. I don't know why it puts it here. There we go. Okay, and Peter Shaw. And the first thing they did is shut down the debtor's court. So this is a picture, and I still meant to change this, and I forgot to do this. They had just literally thrown a judge down the hill. That's the foot of the judge, but I cut off the picture. And. <coughs> They shut it down and said, no longer are we going to lose our farms. No longer are we going to be put in jail because we can't pay debts. The system is rigged, and they didn't have the right to vote. There was nothing they could do. And the state sent in the militia, like the state always did. And this is Shade right here. I like that newspaper. Like, OK. What did the militia do? They joined. Yep. Just like Bacon's Rebellion, the militia they sent in was local militia. Many of them were the same farmers who were upset about the same thing. In fact, they sympathized with Shays. And so they marched basically all through western Massachusetts, went to an armory, and got weapons in Springfield, the armory for the militia, and they were going to march on Boston. The only thing that saved the elite in Boston was winter. The rebellion we put down because partially winter, but then something else. Think about farmers, they had to go pick the crops. But as the army marched towards Boston, as they're marching towards Boston, in the winter hit, the elite of Boston, and this is going to spread throughout the colonies, all you know, merchants and the big plantation owners are freaking out. They're hearing about this and saying, what if this spreads to New York, Pennsylvania, Virginia? They paid off a militia made up of the urban poor to put down the rural poor. So they used the urban-rural divide that really exists today. Just look at the way people vote today, urban versus rural. It's kind of shocking. It's really shocking, actually, urban versus rural divide. And the idea was the urban poor, who even though are kind of, they might have the same problems that the rural poor did, and the same creditors, they didn't see themselves as farmers or unified. This will be used time after time, probably. That divide. This is just like Bacon's Rebellion, how they divided people with those slave codes. And also, you combine this with color of skin to use time after time. Chase would actually be pardoned, and he would he would die in, in what, Vermont 30 years later. But this was a massive class rebellion, much like Bacon's Rebellion. And the elite, the merchant class, the plantation owners, the creditors were sitting there thinking, oh, God, the people are beginning to think they have a voice. 
We let them believe they have a voice in government with the Revolutionary War, and look what that has done. They might pass laws to benefit them, aka workers. Pass laws against high interest rates or rent control is what they wanted. And we need a national government. Because what could the national government do? The Confederation Congress, when they rebel, nothing. There's no national army. There's no executive. They could do literally nothing. Just like when Connecticut and New York fought. They could do nothing. So imagine a situation where there's a rebellion inside the United States and there's nothing the government can do. And today, obviously, there's state and federal apparatus to do something about that, potentially. Heck, in your lifetime, there has been a rebellion and an attempted coup to overthrow the government. That's happened in your lifetime. January 6, 2021. And it was a little bit slow to actually do anything about it, even though hundreds have been arrested after the fact. But there is an apparatus to do that. So, Shay's Rebellion, the wealthy or elite, however you want to put it, are bad. Just absolutely bad. They had already been worried about this situation. They looked at Vermont, allowing for inflation as a direct threat to their livelihoods. So, as their thought, we have too many people who think they have power, a.k.a. too much democracy, or as they like to say, mobocracy. We can't let this ignorant mob democracy tell us what to do. We have to make sure there's a government of a better sort. And here, the prosperity of the sun, and these are going to be those who want a strong central government, and these going off into the stormy clouds and a little bit of kind of crude humor. So we need a stronger central government. But more than just that, there has to be barriers. The mob, AKA us, have got to be constrained. We need barriers between the government and the mob. So the mob can influence the government. Now remember, the mob who wanted democracy would help directly lead to the Declaration of Independence when they marched on Independence Hall back in May of 1776. But now those very same people who used the mob to get independence now want the mob, AKA the people, to have less of a voice. Now, 1786 in Annapolis, Maryland, there had already been, there had already been a, forgot something already been a meeting of some of the elite. Basically, their point of view is we need a strong central government to deal with interstate or trade between the states and international trade. And that's once again personified. This is like literally right after Connecticut and New York were shooting each other over tariffs on shoes. Heck, the year before, George Washington had an informal meeting at his home at Mount Vernon for the same thing. So there's already talk about strong central government, and then boom, Shays Rebellion. The government could do nothing, and now we need this strong central government, this tiny group of Americans we're saying. And there might have been more agree with them, but that is going to lead directly to the Constitutional Convention. So Shays' Rebellion led to the Constitutional Convention. The reason I mentioned Annapolis is because they were already talking about it. Philadelphia Independence Hall. And they actually had a, a legal mandate. The Articles, the Articles of Confederation Congress passed the law unanimously for a convention to strengthen the Articles. Basically to come up with an amendment to try to make the Articles stronger. But remember, we required 13 states. So they're going to be filled up. <laughs> Almost immediately, the majority of people who went to the convention, and they were chosen by the state assemblies, said, Let's throw out this government, make our own. We've got to get rid of the articles. So immediately, they were violating the law. A bunch of them went home. The entire New York delegation went home, even though some of them wanted to change the government. That is, looking back at it, that was in October 2019. This is a line queued up to go in. So 
the Constitutional Convention. They immediately decided the 55 who remain secret meetings. Now, there are two reasons they gave for secret meetings. One, and yet they both have elements of truth. You can decide which one is more important. They said they want to show impartiality. They didn't want to look like they were being influenced by certain people. Now, that could be just you know, workers who want better pay, or plantation owners want protection for slavery, or the merchants who want uh, lower tariffs, whatever it might be. No, we won't be influenced, we'll be in secret. The term we would say today would be they didn't want to be blocked. But the term lobby didn't exist yet. Lobby in that context. So, and the other one is simple. It's treason. Think about it for a second. If you get a group of people who are going to meet to strengthen the article, that's the law, and they decide, no, we're going to throw out the existing government and replace it with a different government that we like and arguably benefits us, that's treason. And they did not want to be accused of treason. So they met in secret. Of course, you can imagine once you meet in secret, everyone's going to have spread all kinds of rumors. They were really worried about being called traitors. And they were. They were called traitors. Yeah, I mean, kind of is. A few more things. Slavery? Almost immediately, it was like, well, what did what we do about slavery? We all know slavery. We'll have to do something about slavery. Slavery, they all knew, would, could potentially destroy the government. Could potentially destroy it. So, they decided to do what people in this position have done since the beginning of time. They kicked it down the road. We'll worry about it later. Meaning they're not going to deal with it. They won't deal with slavery. Next, they all did agree that the federal government would be supreme. And despite what you might hear about the Constitution, there was no plan for any kind of democracy. They wanted to stifle democracy. This was anti-democratic. So they're meeting. And almost immediately, you can imagine what's going to happen. The most populous states and the smaller states begin to kind of split off. There's going to be two conflicting plans. So it's going to be the Virginia plan and the Connecticut plan. Two columns. Not Connecticut, I'm sorry, New Jersey. Let's do Virginia first. James Madison would do most of the writing of it. That's why he's called the father of the Constitution. He did not write it. Completely just like Thomas Jefferson did not write the entire Declaration of Independence. But it was his template. James Mason helped a lot. A guy by the name of uh, Edmund Randolph, a prominent Virginia family, would introduce it. Madison's the name we need to know. So, bicameral legislature. Bicameral, meaning how many houses? The British Parliament has a House of Commons and a House of Lords. And they both must agree back then before it can be it can be sent to the king to become law. Today the House of Lords has no power, so it's their union. The fact of this. It would be apportioned by let by population. But you notice I put a line through it. That didn't happen. The idea would be apportioned, meaning the number of seats per state in each legislature would be decided by population. The greater the population in the state, the more members of the upper and lower house. The upper and lower house. That did not happen. That's why it's called the big state. So they were saying the articles was unfair because Virginia has the same number of votes as Rhode Island, and Virginia's population was, was four times bigger. The lower house that would be decided by the voters. Everything else, no. And there was no, there was no right to vote. Every state decided who would vote. So some only the very wealthy would um, 
only wealthy men with property, some less property. Pennsylvania allowed all men to vote, and some states allowed for women with property to vote. So everyone had different laws. And some allowed, if you have property, didn't matter color or skin. Some it did matter. The executive would be decided by the House. That did not happen either. <clears throat> now you notice the voters, that did happen. That's Madison's plan. So that is the basic template of our government. The New Jersey plan, William Patterson, small state, very simple. Unicameral, one house. Equal, by rep equal, equal representation by state, and there would be an executive. A court system, a few other things, but this is all we care about. This one's pretty close to what they were supposed to do. The law was passed by the Confederation to reform it, and that's pretty much a reform. So, unicameral, very basic. This is supposedly Madison. We don't know much. There was nobody taking notes. Remember, this was all in secret. There was nobody taking minutes. All we know about the convention are private notes that members wrote. And you know, private notes, then it's about what they were doing and their bias. The best is Mad Madison's notes on the Constitutional Convention. So we'll, we, we don't know everything that happened. This is secret. They're committing treason, potentially. Well, a compromise would come about. There's going to be three big compromises. You notice the number one. The Great Compromise or the Connecticut Plan. So Sherman, the same one of the authors of the Declaration of Independence, it's following the template of the Virginia Plan. Bicameral. Two houses, and they both must agree on a law or a bill before it can be passed on to the president to become a law. The lower house, this is the lower house, it's called the House of Representatives. They're chosen by the voters, but remember, there's no rules on voting, so every state has their own rules. How many, uh, how many years is a term? They decide to give terms. Most countries don't do this. The United States does. How long is a term? Roman? Two, four, six, eight, two. It's by population and for terms. So the bigger the state, the more members of the house. Every state has to have a minimum of one. And then you get, in the Constitution, it's for every 30,000 for every 30,000 people, you get a member. So the House kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger as a country grew. About 120, about 110 years ago, they cut it off. So this is what we have to write down. Does anybody know how many members of the United States House of Representatives there are now? It's cut off at a certain amount. That's it. 435, everyone put down 435. Well, the Constitution says there'll be a census every 10 years. So be, the next census for you guys will be 2030. For me, too, I guess. I'm around. And it will be the reimportion. So before, they would just would add members. Now, new census, they figure out the population for every state, and then they divvy up those 435 members. So states like Wyoming have one. If you gain population, you might gain a seat. Lose it, you might lose it. For example, in 1990, Montana's population was stagnant. Other states grew faster. Montana went from two members of the House to one. And then in 2020, what happened? Now yeah, we're back up to two. I can't imagine. Well, if we stay at 435 members, Montana will be at two for a very, 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 very long time. But we have two. So in 2020, for example, California's population went up, but not as fast as other places. So they actually lost a couple. And Texas, for example, gained a couple. The South is growing really fast, which is also really surprising. They're the ones most at risk for bad weather, hurricanes, or fire, or extreme heat, or drought. Yet the population is growing. They have no zoning laws. But 
it's really interesting that that happened. But so the seats don't go up and down that way. 435. What state has the most members of the House? Yeah, yeah, California. When um, all through, up until the, the 1980s, it was New York, and then California passed it. Now Texas and Florida both passed it, York, which is pretty wild to me. And two terms. So every two years, all 435 members are up for re-election. Tax bills start here. So any money, any bill about taxing and or spending start there. And this is a tradition from Britain that starts in the House of Parliament or the House of Commons. Some of you might have heard of something called the Magna Carta. That's where that comes from. If you took AP Euro, you might remember Magna Carta. Yeah. The Senate. How many years is a term for the Senate? Or how many members of the Senate are there per state? Two. Two per state. Six-year term. Originally, all the way up to 1913, they were still chosen by state assemblies. I put a line through that saying that isn't the way it is now. The 17th Amendment would happen, and now it's chosen by voters. But all, we, we'll get to that, obviously, down the road. But state assemblies. Everyone got that? State assemblies, and now it's the vote. Six-year term. So every two years, all 435 members of the House are up and a third of the senators. So, for example, Montana, we have one, one seat at Senate up, one of, the, one of our two seats. Next election, there'll be no members of the Senate, and then there'll be another one up. That's just the way it is. So, which one favors small states? Yeah, this is for the small states. That's the compromise. Big states. Everyone got that? Small states, big states. So it doesn't matter the population. Wyoming has two members of the Senate. California has two members of the Senate. Um, which, well, we'll get to that later. So the executive. And they hemmed and hawed about names for the executive. They finally settled on the president because there had been a president. Oh, I didn't tell you. Who was the first person with the title president? It was John Hanks. That was Continental Congress. It was, it was Continental Congress. Wrong Congress. It's, it's, you're really close. So, executive. And how many year term? Four. Who chooses them? The voters don't. The Electoral College, they're called electors. Electors choose the president to a four year term. When the Constitution was written, how many terms could a president serve? And they say one as long as they're re elected. 1947, they amended it for two terms. That's what it is for two terms. He's been elected for more than, there's only been one president elected for more than two terms. Yeah, yeah, Franklin Roosevelt, four terms. Or he was elected four times. He, he passed away in this fourth term. Now it's only two. Only two. That's still a lot. That's still eight years. Being a president is difficult to be elected. I don't know if you know that. We'll talk about why there's only two parties in just a second. We're getting there. But it is the president. The voters do not choose the president to this day. It's the Electoral College. Electors go and choose a president. That's how it's done. Remember what I told you, they wanted barriers between the mob and the um, mob and the government. Most people couldn't vote, so only the elite could vote. Only the elite of the elite were state assembly. And only and electors are chosen by state assembly state. Therefore, the elite of the elite pick the elite to vote for the elites. Okay, that's a very rude way of saying the president. Most people have no voice. And this isn't even talking, talking about judges, which they just kind of, they did that really quick. <laughs> but the judges are not voted on at all. This was all done to avoid democracy. 
the electors. How many electors does each state have? How many electors does Montana have? Two members of the House, two members of the Senate. Four. It's by your total members of Congress. Congress is the House and the Senate. Even though senators are called senator, members of the House are called congressmen or congresswomen. But Congress is the House and the Senate. But when they'll say just Congress um, as a title, they're usually referring to the House. So, but members of Congress. The minimum, what's the minimum you can have then? What's the lowest number of electors a state can have? Three. It's like Wyoming has three. Montana, you know, we're so much bigger than Wyoming. We have four. So that's the Electoral College. Now, who picks the electors? Up until the 1820s, it was state assembly. Beginning in the 1820s, in this wave of democracy, which is personified by Andrew Jackson, democracy. Um, Jackson's an interesting person. But states, state assemblies started voting to change their rules to saying, okay, we vote that the electors will be chosen by the voters. And every state by the end of the Civil War passed that law. So voters choose the electors. Everyone got that? Voters choose it. That means on election day, we have 51 separate elections for president. And this is supposed to be winner take all, but I put down whiter. <laughs> I just realized that. I forgot an end. I got tired. I couldn't type in that last end. Why do we have two ends? Who's with me? Let's just have one end for winner. You agree? Who's with me? Yeah, let's take it. It's winner take all. It is winner take all, except for two states. I'll explain that in a second. So we have 51 separate elections. Did you catch what I just said? There 51? Most of you probably know we have less than 51 states. So let's go through this. How many electors are there? You should know. You have the numbers in front of you. How many electors? 535. Okay, it was 535 up until 1971. And then they amended the Constitution to give the District of Columbia three electoral votes. So this is what we have to put down, 538 electors. So DC and every other state vote. So how many electors is it needed to win? Say it again? Two seven. Two seven. You need two seven. 269 is a tie. No one has a majority. And so we have to wait. So now, every once in a while, I get someone in here who can vote. My guess is none of you can vote next election. Is that right? Anyone, is there anyone who can vote? OK. So you have to wait until 2028. So when I go in and vote, when I get the ballot for president, it will say, it will say on Kamala Harris and Tony. It will say uh, Donald Trump and Jamie Harris. The president and vice president now run as a ticket. That started in 1801. But they run. I will vote for one of those two. So let's say if I vote for Trump, I'm voting for four electors pledged for Trump. If I vote for Harris, I'm voting for four electors pledged to Harris. So the parties do that. The Democratic Party, what for the Republican Party? Some states elect, um, list the electors. So I'm not voting for president. I'm voting for electors pledged to vote for that president in the Electoral College. So to this day, it's still electors that do this. And it's winner take all. So whoever wins that election gets all the electors in that state. So if, okay, almost certainly Trump is going to win in Montana. So Trump will get all four electors. In California, Harris will, no doubt. And so she'll get off what, 53 electors. Do you want to catch what I'm getting at? Winner take all, except for two states. Maine and Nebraska, they have winner take all for two, and then they do for each congressional district. Whoever wins that gets the one electoral. So, like Nebraska has 
five electors, two, it's winner take all in the state, and then they have three legislative districts, whoever wants those districts. So for example, in Nebraska, uh, Trump, win, Trump is gonna win the two in the state, win the two in the legislative district, but the other le legislative district is Omaha, and Harris will win that one. So Harris will get one. In Maine, it's the other way around. Maine, uh, Harris will win three, and Trump will win one in the North. Nobody else does that. So everyone catch that? On election night, it's not an election for president. All the popular vote is, they count all the votes pledged for Harris compared to all the votes pledged to Trump. But that doesn't matter. All that matters is the individual elections in every state, and it's winner take all. Everyone catch what I'm getting at. So, the popular vote doesn't matter for the entire country, only in states. Montana, who cares? Our votes, I guarantee you, Trump is going to win. So those four electoral votes will be going to Trump. In California, there's no way Trump is going to win. Even close. I'm close. Texas might be close. New York, no way Trump will win. Ohio, no way Harris will win. So if you are in the state and the votes are thrown away. So we have 51 elections, or 51 little um, elections in each state. I'll show you a little bit more about this, but let's get to the last couple of things. Oh, almost forgot. Let's get to the key element here. It's winner take all. In the Electoral College, it's winner take all. Do you ever catch what the big deal about that is? If it's winner take all, what's going to happen? How many groups will end up putting up somebody for president if it's winner take all? If you don't have winner take all, I'm sorry, if you have winner take all, and you have, let's say, three people running, that third person, like a third party, is going to take votes away from the other two. You ever catch what I said there? We'll take away votes. So you know one of them probably won't win, but you vote for that third party, it will take away votes. So what's going to happen? Who will vote for the third party if they're going to take away votes from the other two? Almost nobody. So how many parties are you going to have? Two. That's why you have to put that in the last one. That's why we have two parties. Winner take all in the Electoral College. It started there. Led to two-party system. So if you look at the two parties, I hate the two parties, and the body which the party. Well, you can't have third parties in a winner take all system. Because they'll take away votes from someone. It just they don't work. Every third party candidate either take away votes or maybe like one shooting star, one election, there'll be a famous personality who do well, then they'll fade away. We're stuck with winner take all, two parties. Every country with winner take all, it's two parties. If you have proportional, like, like let's say Germany, where you went over 5% of the vote, you have members of their parliament called the Reichstag, I'm sorry, the Bundestag, then you have more parties. So in Germany, you have about, about 10 major parties because everyone has a chance. Here, nope, two. Canada, actually, Canada's weird. In some, they have two parties in some areas, the, the Conservative Party and the, Liberal, and the Liberal Party, and in some areas it's the Conservative Party and the New Democratic Party, who are kind of allies with the Liberals. But it's two parties. Just the way it is, two party, so that's why third parties don't work. That's why. I'm not a fan, but that's the system we have because it's a winner take home. So, who's favored in this system? Who's favored? Who has the benefit, the advantage in this system? <clears throat> Which states, big states or small states? Small states by far. Small states are favored so much it's actually kind of crazy how much small states are benefiting. 
Wyoming has the same number of electors as California. That means every voter in Wyoming has more influence over the Senate than voters in California. You ever catch that? Montana has the same number of voters as Texas. Montana's not even close. Montana's almost 30 times smaller. And we have the same number of members of the Senate. Small states have a huge advantage in the Senate and in what else? I know it doesn't seem like it, but in the Electoral College. Small state voters have more votes, or have more power per vote, more influence per vote than large state voters. Montana's voters have more influence than California's voters. I know it doesn't seem like it because of the number of electors, but remember, we don't have many people. We just have a little over a million. And they have over 30. And also think about how this works. All those voters in states like California who voted for Trump in the last election, their votes are meaningless. Yeah. So it's less people who are the same amount of votes. Yeah. I'll finish this tomorrow right after the quiz. I don't know if I should have done that. I don't know if I trust you people ever again. I don't remember doing that. I thought, yeah. I don't think I did. I think the only reason is because we didn't get to shape the belly. I think I might be it. All right, quiz will be real quick tomorrow. And you have to stay here until. I have to stay here until school's over. So I, but I get out at six, and then I get to go to work.